Our Father, we thank you for this time of gathering together. We bless your name because it has pleased you to draw us unto yourself and to open your scriptures, your own word to us. There is none like you who can tell the meaning of what you wrote. And here you have gathered us together to show us exactly what you meant by what you said. And it is only when we hear from you through the pages of your own word that we can be the people you want us to be. And here we come now wanting to listen to you, speak to us on what you meant in your word by faith. So that we'll be able to have this great thing you have provided for your own children. And so that there will be a change within us. Amen. And there will be a change around us. Amen. And there will be a change through us. Amen. Let your mighty hand be upon us. Amen. Here we are as preachers, as leaders, as pastors. You have called us. All we need from you is the equipment and the power for service. Amen. And we know you are going to give us. Amen. So Lord, we pray for all of us who are present here, our state representatives, our pastors, our zonal leaders, area leaders, house fellowship leaders, and all women representatives and all categories of workers. We know you love every one of us the same. And you are willing to use every one of us. Amen. Therefore, Lord, we pray that as we stretch ourselves on the altar before you, you will touch us. Amen. You will bless us. Amen. You will empower us. Amen. Lord, as we go away from this workers' retreat, we will not go away feeling empty, Amen. feeling as if nothing has been added. Amen. But we'll feel as we go saturated Amen. and full and bold Amen. and determined to do the work you have given us to do. And we know that others have succeeded. Amen. You are not less powerful today as you were at the time of John Wesley, at the time of Charles G. Finney, even at the time of Paul the Apostle or Peter. You are still as mighty as ever. Amen. And you can bless us like you bless them. Amen. You can use us as we use them. Amen. We are before you. And Father, we pray that every one of us will be blessed by you. Amen. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's read from Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 1 to 3 and verses 39 and 40. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by each the elders obtained a good report through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Verse 39, and all and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. This period we are talking on faith. You can qualify it as precious faith, qualify it as dynamic faith, qualify it as living faith, Qualify it as the faith that works. Qualify it as the like precious faith. But 
whichever way we qualify it, we want to speak on faith. Reading this chapter, I've read the first three verses and the last two verses. But the subject of faith is so important and so essential. As we look at the chapter, you'll see Abraham, sorry, you'll see Abel by faith. And he appeared to be the only one single out in his own generation. Small generation, small group of people, but faith singled him out. Enoch, in his own generation, again, just one person, specific, unique, identified as different. Faith qualified him so. Noah lived in a generation, and there are many things you could say to describe that generation, but whatever we say, whatever we don't say, faith singled out Noah. Again, it was by faith. Now you think of the expanded population at the time of Abraham. Many religions had come up. Territories and provinces had increased. And of course, people, Hebrews and non-Jewish, had also developed. But among all of them, at its own time, people with various backgrounds, ethics, religion. Faith, again, identified Abraham as different. And as you look into his family, it seems to have expanded the effect and the influence and the impact of faith. Because right in that family you have Sarah. Then you eventually have Isaac and Jacob. And it appears that this time, it wasn't just a single Abel, a single Enoch, a single Noah in whole generations. But you obviously seem to have now a whole family. And the family became identified as different and unique again, all through faith. Then we come to that most revered, respected, honored man of God. His name, Moses. And again, faith spotted him out. And it is the faith that is capitalized upon. You know that Joseph, among all the many children of Jacob, also attained to the place of excellence, a unique position, a great privilege he had, and all through all that, through faith. Going down the line, and I'll come to the gentle world. Even in Canaan, even in Jericho, even among those idolatrous people that seem not to have a single text of scripture about the only true God, you have Rahab, a woman, and not a woman that had been so morally sound, so lifted up about the moral standards of society, yet faith lifted her up, even though she had no morals to give for her position. But that shows the special position that faith holds. Then you come into the time of the judges, and you have a number of them mentioned. But it appears that just one could qualify to come into the chapter of the heroes of faith in each of the generations. Well, that opens up something in your own heart. That perhaps faith is not a very common commodity. That you find in every heart, in every home, in every generation. And that if we're going to have faith, we might almost be a lone ranger. And we might have to desire it and how to seek after it, how to pray and do everything we have to do, so that in our own generation, perhaps, in the generation of the proliferation of churches, where churches are just springing up, 
in states and cities and provinces. You can say, in my own generation, at my own time, in my own community, I want to be singled out like these people have been singled out in their own generation. And the thing that marks you out, singles you out, is this faith we're talking about. Before we get into what it is, what it is not, what it does, and how to have it, I want to show you the importance of faith. And as I show you this importance, I'll be comparing two verses at a time. One for God and one for the believing man. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, Matthew chapter 9, verse 26, the companion verse to that. The twin verse to that, that I want to link up with Matthew chapter 19 verse 26 will be Mark chapter 9 verse 23. I want you to open both references and just uh, put your finger in one while we refer to the other. Matthew chapter 19 verse 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men. This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth. Matthew chapter 19 refers to God within the creator of heaven and earth. The one that never had doubt, unbelief, impossibility thinking, a moment or a minute from the one end of eternity to the last end of eternity, with him we are told that all things are possible. And then, if it were not for the Lord Jesus Christ himself that said this other companion verse, this other verse that says the same thing about man, about the believing man, it will almost seem to be blasphemous. Because he said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Notice two uh, four words that follow one another without any rearrangement. In Matthew chapter, chapter 19 verse 26, all things are possible. Those four words follow one another, but referring to God. In Mark chapter 9 verse 23, look at it in the middle, all things are possible. No rearrangement, just like that for God and for the believing man. That makes faith important. Not only that, as you look at Matthew chapter 19 verse 26, it's prefaced with, with men. This is impossible. But then Mark, from what Jesus said, singled out some people from the general group or assembly of humanity and said, as with men, the ordinary men, the majority of men, this is impossible. All things are possible with God. And there are some people who by faith are lifted up from the generality of humanity and they also, because they believe, they find all things possible. What a challenge. That faith is so important. Well, if it's that important, we must do something about it. I also want to refer to another pair of verses. This time saying the same thing, but from a negative direction. 
that is in the use of the language. You know, the use of the language, all things are possible, that's positive. It's saying this can be done. This is possible. That's the positive direction used for God and used for the believing man. Now, the other pair. In Luke chapter 1, verse, 20, verse 37, I want you to put your finger there and then open the companion verse, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Luke chapter 1, verse 37, and then the companion verse, accompanying verse, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Again, Luke 1, 37, about God. And Matthew chapter 17, about man. Let's look at Luke 1, 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. This one is couched or framed in a negative way. But it's still approaching the same thing. All things are possible. Nothing shall be impossible. In fact, when you say it like that, all things are possible. And should you miss the import and the impact of what is said, nothing shall be impossible. That completes it. It means that absolutely and certainly and assuredly, all things without an exception are possible. And now with God, nothing shall be impossible. Notice again, just four words. Nothing shall be impossible. And come to Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And notice our four words again. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. No rearrangement. As it was said for God, nothing shall be impossible. So it is said for the believing man, nothing shall be impossible. Moses did not hear this. But how did he feel when he stood before the Red Sea? And it appeared that these twins of four words must have been in his heart. All things are possible, nothing shall be impossible. Well then, if that is so, the Red Sea can be divided. Joshua did not hear the message directly from the lips of Jesus, but what could he have felt when the day was drawing to a close and he needed the sunshine of the day to finish the battle of the day? And he knew that the only thing that will lengthen the day is to stop the sun where it was and give sunshine so there will be light for the day of battle. Well, though he did not hear these companion words, all things are possible, nothing shall be impossible, he must have felt the same as he told the sun to stand still. What would Elisha have felt? When it was reported, that boy had died. And he knew that he got the double portion of the Spirit of God. And that woman would not let him go. Held on to his feet and said, man of God, did I not tell you to, not to deceive me? Look at it now, the child is gone. And he told Gehazi, take the rod. Don't greet anybody by the way. When you get there, lay the rod on that child, and the child should come back to life. Gehazi, a representative of the generality of the servants of the prophets, living with the prophet, but not living in the faith of the prophet, sharing room with the prophet, but not sharing confidence and trust of the prophet, holding the rod of the prophet, but not being saturated with the faith word of the prophet. He came back and he reported, it's impossible. That's the report. 
of the generality of church members. That's the report of the majority of Bible students in Bible schools. That's the report of the academic Christians who only read in seminaries. They come back with the rod, they come back with the word, it's impossible. How did Elisha feel? Did he feel the impact of those twin companion words? All things are possible. Nothing shall be impossible. And he got in there. Before he came out, he brought out a living child. That's why it's important that we who say that we're ministers of the gospel, we're workers in the church, we're children of God, we must learn what these words mean. Nothing shall be impossible for God and nothing shall be impossible unto you if you can only believe. But Jesus knew that it will not be a common commodity you find in every heart, in every home, and in every minister. So before he went away, he left a question unanswered. When the Son of Man shall come, Shall he find faith on the earth? He knew it was possible because he said so. But, again, like we said before, who are the people that will know the importance seriously enough and go after it? And like Christian, if you have read the Pilgrim's Progress, he was going after something. His wife called him. The children were crying. The neighbors were calling for him. He put his two fingers in two ears and was shouting, eternal life, eternal life. He kept on running. He met the mountain on the way. It almost just crushed him, but he kept on. He climbed on the mountain top. He saw the gate ahead, and he knew that what I'm looking for is right there. He had to look for it, though, without the companionship of the people he loved. But he wanted it so hard. He wanted it so seriously that he could not allow anything to hinder him. And that is a representative of the people that will have this great good commodity, faith. It will make you different. It will spot you out as a different person on the face of the earth. It can mark you out as a unique individual even in the whole church and in the church in the church world. Faith. But then, as we have known the importance, I'll just give you in three simple points. Number one, what it is not. What it is not. Number two, what it takes. Number three, what it does. What? It is not. You know, it's so very disappointing. If you have your pocket full of currency notes and of all various denominations, and you are so sure that you'll get whatever you want, you'll buy whatever you desire, then you get to the market, you brought out a particular denomination of uh, currency, and they look at it, they say it's counterfeit. You bring, in an, you bring out another denomination, they look at it, they say it's counterfeit. You brought all the money you have in your pocket or in your briefcase on the table. They look at everything and they say it's counterfeit. Your pocket, your briefcase was full of currency notes. But what a disappointment that they're all counterfeit. And you know, many times we go to the market, talking now spiritually, we know that the money that gets anything you want is the faith. And you think you have all the denominations of faith. You have the growing faith, you have the gift of faith, you have the dynamic faith, you have the living faith, that's what you think. You have the faith that worketh by love, that's what you think. And only at the time you are to pray for the sake, cast out the devil, lead people to the Lord. You bring out all the denominations of faith and they say it's counterfeit. 
and you come back home with nothing from the market. That's why it's important that we should ask ourselves what faith is not and what faith is. What faith is not? Number one, it is not a set of beliefs, a set of dogmas. I believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth, the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that is omnipotent and all present, the one that has been from generations past to generations to come. That's good, but that's not the faith we're talking about. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, was buried, and rose up the third day. That's good doctrine, dogma, but not the faith we're talking about. And you can go through all the set of beliefs that people have. And when you have gone through all that, you are still to reach out for the faith we're talking about. Number two, it is not a feeling of boldness to challenge anyone at any time in any situation. You know, there are people that are born naturally bold, strong, aggressive, militant. And they say, you know, I have a great, great faith. I can challenge anyone, anywhere, at any time. And um, you find that maybe you are walking along the road, and here you have a Christian and another Christian, and as you are going, there are some dogs barking at you. Others are shivering, and this fellow just walked on straight, very, very bold and aggressive. And then he drove away the dogs, and then you all passed. And he smiled and said, you see, I have a lot of faith. That's not faith. That's just natural boldness. So it is not a feeling of boldness to challenge anyone, anytime, in any circumstance. Number three, it is not a general belief in the existence of God. It is not a general belief in the existence of God. Don't we have to believe the existence of God? Yes, we have to. But so, the Muslims have to believe in the existence of God. So many religions all over the world, in fact, the very basis, the very source, and the very root of Many, many religions is the fact that God exists. And so, if uh, I just believe that God exists and he's so great, he's so far away, he's living up there in heaven, I cannot say because I believe that therefore now I have faith. Not the type of faith we're talking about. You still need to go beyond the general belief of the existence of God to talk about the faith we're thinking of. Number four, it is not an imitated action of some Bible heroes. It is not the imitated action of some Bible heroes. Now we have all seen how Jesus prayed for the lame. Rise up, take thy bed. And then I go before the lame person. And without knowing what faith is all about, the real faith, I challenge the man. Rise up. Take up thy bed. Even a parrot can repeat that. If you repeat it long enough for the parrot to pick up and store in the brain. The parrot can also say, take thy bed, rise up, take thy bed. So faith is not the imitated action of some Bible heroes. How many times have you seen some people that they will take a man that is lame, pull him up, say in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And then we drag him, we drag him. And the man is sweating and uh, goose pimples coming all over the body, the pains like the pinching of a needle coming all over the body. And the man is, on, is almost crying, saying, and we say, just believe, just believe, God will do it now, God will do it now. And we pull him and we drag him and we run, dragging him. And eventually he slouches or just gets down. And then he cries, he's having pains. He says, bring my wheelchair. And then we put him there again. 
Oh, we say poor man. I have the faith. He doesn't have the faith. Just the imitation of what Jesus Christ did. Imitating the action without the real power to back up the action. And so faith is not the imitated action of some Bible heroes. And number five, faith is not a hope that things may eventually turn out well by luck or by chance. Faith is not the hope that things may eventually turn out well by luck or by chance. Well, sister, have you got married? No, not really. Have you really definitely prayed in faith that, um, you know, God will do it and you will have the life partner? Well, you know, I, I just believe God that somehow, somebody in any part of the world will write a letter to me. I hope I will not be unlucky. I just feel that by chance or by luck, I will get married eventually. That's not faith. Now, brother, how about uh, this uh, marriage? Oh, I believe God. What do you mean you believe God? Well, I just believe as large as deeper life is in all the states, all the local government areas, all the major cities, in secondary school, in university, on the street, and deeper life everywhere, I hope, I believe that uh, one day, somehow, I will come across that person. And the person either will write to me or by luck or by chance, something will work out that I will get married. That's not faith. Faith is not the hope that things may eventually turn out well by luck or by chance. Now here you are, you are sick. What are you doing about your healing? Well, I don't understand. I don't, I don't know. But uh, I, don't, I know that I will be healed. How do you know? God has been healing every other person. And uh, luckily or by chance, or I will come across somebody that will either lay hands on me or I know that I will get healed. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know where, but somehow I think I'll be healed. That's not faith. The hope that something will turn out well, by and by, sometime, somewhere, somehow. I don't know how and when. Luckily or by chance, that's different from faith. So it's necessary for us to know what faith is not. So that we'll be able to focus attention on what faith is. Now, what is faith? Well, I know you can repeat for me Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. But let's look away from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 for the moment and look into other parts of scripture and begin to gather from these scriptures what faith is. Because if we know what faith is, it becomes easier for us to know when we've got it and to know what we have to do so that we'll have it. What is faith? Number one, it is belief in the absolute truthfulness of God's promises. The belief in the absolute truthfulness of God's promises. Acts chapter 27, verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. That's faith. Acts 27, verse 25. Let me give you the view or the background of the situation for the Apostle Paul. He was on his way to Rome. He had been in a ship with 275 other people. And there were soldiers there, there were captains, and there were sailors, there were prisoners as well. And they got into a difficulty, great, great difficulty. 
the waves were beating against the ship. It was very, very dangerous. Very dangerous that everybody sensed danger and death. And wanting to help themselves, they were throwing their luggages overboard into the sea. They were all fasting compulsorily. They had no appetite to eat. They felt death was near. They were going to be buried in the, water, in the watery grave with no remembrance, with nobody to remember them or even to locate where they died. And then the angel of the Lord came unto Paul by night and gave him the word and said, you will not die. And God has also given you all the people that are sailing with you. And Paul the apostle rose up and he said, Sirs, be of good cheer. I'm cheerful already. On the inside, my emotions have been changed. My thoughts have been changed. And everything about me has been changed. Right now, I do not have a shred of doubt, a stain of fear, anything about the future. I know we are getting to the shore. Because I believe God. It shall be even as it was told me. That means then, the noise of the waves became subdued by the sound of the promise. What is faith? Absolute truthfulness of God's promises. When the promises have not only been read and accepted and believed, but have been accepted and received and believed to the point that it silences any other voice in your life. It silences what the disease may be saying. You don't need by the fact that you believe in the absolute truthfulness of God's promises. You are not shaking. You are no more sad. You are no more having various and divergent thoughts in your mind or in your heart. You are absolutely sure definitely certain that it shall be even as it was told me that it will be according to the promise it is then that you really realize the import the weight of the words of jesus christ heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall never pass away Though it would seem impossible in the sight of men, with God and with the believing man, all things are possible. So then what is faith? Faith is the absolute truthfulness of God's promise. How do I have that? Or is it possible that, as I've known, what faith is? Looking at that description and definition of faith, I'll just say, okay, now, I will believe in the absolute truthfulness of God's promise. No. It doesn't easily work that way. Now let me uh, show you some experiences, not connected with Christianity or religion, but just human experiences. For example, you know that in the village, we, our parents, our people, our relatives, our neighbors, they've seen dogs before. And all we know about dogs is that, uh, you know, the dog is there, and if the dog is in front of the house, it can uh, bark at any person that is stranger that is approaching. But suppose you go to the village, and the vi this uh, village man has never seen how to train dogs to spot out thieves, and how to use dogs in many, many areas of life, or the government, or the security. And we just tell the a man that if there is a, a thief around, the dog can be so trained to go in the direction and spot out where that thief is. Now he'll say it's impossible. And you can say that apart from the dog just using initiative or instinct, just looking at a stranger, somebody the dog had never seen, you can even speak to the dog and instruct the dog what to want you to do at a particular time, one way or the other. Now, the villager, even though he had seen dogs all along, he will not believe that. How will he believe it? It's a process. Take him to the place where dogs have been trained that way. 
take him, show him how those dogs are now operating like that. Originally, it would look strange. It would look queer. It would look unbelievable. If he lives in that environment for a long time, he believes it naturally that it is possible. Come back on faith. How do I come to believe the absolute truthfulness of God's promise? One, read those promises. Study those promises. And study the people that first received the promises. See their circumstances. See their problems. See the seemingly impossible situations in which they were. And see what faith did and what the promise of God did in their lives. Now, if you do that, you'll come to the point that you just naturally, in human language, that's how we say it. Naturally, you will not know the day it happened. You will just come to believe naturally, without any shadow of doubt, that the promise will always be fulfilled. Not only that, study about God, the faithfulness of God. Not just reading um, Bible verses from concordance and from topical study Bibles, but really sitting down with them. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. But what when we say hearing by the word of God, I hope you don't uh, interpret that to mean that I can read the book of Leviticus throughout the year and then I will have faith. Think about it. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Yes. But that doesn't mean that I will spend all the days of the year in Leviticus and then I'll come out in December 31st and now I have great, great faith. No, there is a part of the word of God that ministers to your faith more than another part. It doesn't mean that I'm going to spend all my life in the book of the Ecclesiastes and have faith and just read from chapter 1 to the end every week and just read and read and read vanity of vanities all is vanity no new thing under the sun as it was so it is so then young man have pleasure with the wife of your youth for everything that a man does good or bad is going to receive a reward for it Remember therefore the Lord in the days of your youth. While the days of darkness have not, have not approached. When you will say, have no pleasure in them. Now if you read all that every week of, of the whole year. You are not going to come out at the end of the year saying, thank God, faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I have all the faith I need. You need more than that. That means then. When you are talking about wanting to have faith and faith cometh by hearing, read the promises. Do you know when people are sick and lean, they put them on diet, on special food. What they had been eating before was food, but now special diet. And when your faith is low, how you need a special diet from the word of God. The promises that you read, that you study, that you fill yourself with, and then you'll come to have absolute faith in the absolute truthfulness of God's promise. Number two, what faith is? It is strong persuasion in divine ability. Strong persuasion. In divine ability. That's faith. Strong persuasion in divine ability. Strong persuasion in divine ability. Second Timothy chapter two. Sorry, Second Timothy chapter one, verse twelve. Second Timothy chapter one verse twelve. For the which cause I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, 
I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's faith. I am persuaded. Because I know whom I have believed. And I know he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What is faith then? Faith is a strong persuasion in divine ability. How do I have that? It is not by saying over and over, I believe God, I believe God, I believe God. With God all things are possible. With God all things are possible. That's good. But that's not the quickest way to have this faith we're talking about. To have the strong persuasion in divine ability. Come back to our school days. We came to school. We got to the class. And when we were in primary school, we had been, we found arithmetic very difficult. And our teachers in the primary school, there were times that will bring this um, Lacombe or Durrell arithmetic to the teacher. And we tell him to solve this problem, and he's not able to solve the problem. And so, we do not have real strong persuasion that any teacher can solve all problems. We got into secondary school and a teacher demonstrated arithmetic or geometry or algebra on the board. And we say, well, he appears good, but only appears good. There's still not strong persuasion. And we children, we look at some problems that are stirred in the book. And then we look at the answer section. So we cram the answer and then we brought to the teacher and said, teacher, uh, please, can you solve this problem? He got on the board, he solved it. It changes your heart. This man may be different from our former teacher in the primary school. Then you find another difficult thing again. The way you know it's difficult is that there's an asterisk uh, beside it. Another time, you give it to the teacher. And then he solves the problem again. You say, this one must be different. You do that for one year, for two years, for three years. By the fourth year, you are not testing that teacher again. You have a strong persuasion in his mathematical ability. That's how to have faith. Now, people who, don't want, who want to have faith, they never read about the miracles, about how God solved the problems. Read those miracles in the Bible and see those children of Israel in the predicament in the impossible situation and you will shake your head and say how is this going to come out and read the answers to those problems and study those miracles a lot of times and see that these miracles many of them had not been performed previously to that time that it was performed for the first time and then if you read much of that long enough and of course if there are testimonies today of what God is doing in our church or in any other place, because God is not limited to the Palai Bible Church, the answers to prayer that God is giving to his own children all over the world, read those miracles. But don't read to just get interested, to just say, well, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that exciting? Read to discover and to be sure of the divine ability. And then you will come to see that your faith is growing. And you'll have this strong persuasion in divine ability. So then what is faith? Number one, faith is that belief in the absolute truthfulness of God's promise. Number two, faith is a strong persuasion in divine ability. Number three, faith is the belief in the sufficiency of God's word. Believe in the sufficiency of God's word through Christ to solve all problems. Believe in the sufficiency of God's word through Christ to solve all problems. 
Now, the generality of Christians and believers all over the world, they believe that God can solve some of our problems through his word. But that's not the faith we're talking about. But for you to come to the knowledge, to the position that the word of God is sufficient. Not just sufficient to develop doctrine. We know it is sufficient to develop Bible doctrine. That if there is any doctrine you're trying to believe, which is not consistently taught, built up, and developed in the word of God, that that doctrine is false. We already know that. But we're talking of faith. That you come to believe that the word of God is sufficient to solve all problems. There are personal problems. Financial, physical, spiritual. You study the word of God to the point that whatever problems you have today, some people had it in Bible days and only faith saw them through. Now the word of God is sufficient. Do you know there are times our families have problems? Problems beyond medical science. Problems beyond the ability of our in-laws. Problems that seem staggering. And yet, faith is the belief in the sufficiency of God's work through Christ to solve all problems. It's not likely you have a problem that will demand the stopping of the sun. But if you did, that problem can be solved by faith. With bridges built today, it's not likely that you will have the problem of having to cross over a deep sea, not a brook, not just a river, but a sea like an ocean. It's not likely you'll have the difficulty of having to cross over it without a bridge. But if you did, faith can solve that problem. It may not be likely that you'll find yourself in the wilderness somewhere and you have to feed 5,000 hungry men without counting the fainting women and the crying children. And with just little loaves of bread in your hand, it's not likely you'll have that problem because before you bring uh, together 5,000 and more, you'll do a lot of publicity. And normally, your publicity is limited by your finance and the accommodation. So it's not likely. But should in case it happens, faith solved that problem before. It's not likely that you will go into a home of an individual and this individual would have lost his child and will come to you that, man of God, what have I done that you have brought my sin in remembrance? It's likely that most of the people, if their child died like that, they will cry but they will not accuse you. And they might ask you for help of vehicle to take the child to mortuary. It's not likely they would say, now look at the child, give the child back to me now. Otherwise, you are the cause. Maybe they are not likely to accuse you like that. But should, should in case they do that, faith can solve that problem. It's not likely that you'll wake up early in the morning and you'll drag a public prostitute to you qualify to die? Not likely. But if they did, faith can solve that problem. It's not likely that somebody who has been married for 24 years, going to 25 years now, and has become 90 years of age, 89 years of age, will come to you and say, I still have this strong desire within me to carry my own baby. My husband is 100 years old, almost now. But this desire has never let me. We married more than 24 years ago. But I try to shake it off because we have so many servants and we have so many people. And I just send this one, go this way, he goes, go that way, uh, he goes. But even at 89, I still have this strong, strong desire. Now, can you pray for me? Not likely you have an old, old woman like that that will come for prayer for child. But should in case it happens, faith can solve that problem. 
You get the point? Faith is the belief in the sufficiency of God's word to solve all problems through Christ. Recently, we had a testimony in our fellowship at Bagada here. A man that had married 1966, January 22nd. Until last year, 1986, after 20 years, there was no crying baby in the house. Only the two of them. They woke up, they went out, they came in, they fought, they quarreled, they settled, they lived. But then they came last year, around February. And even while they were before me, talking to them, the woman argued, the man replied, it was a drama before me. You don't care for me. I know you are not interested. Maybe you are the cause. Maybe this, maybe that. And if I don't care all these 20 years, would I not have sent you out and married another person? Don't you know I even tried? I kept you in the house without any child all these 20 years. And I sat down. I knew they wouldn't beat themselves. <laughs> so after all the discussion and the argument, I said, now that's enough. Let's pray. <laughs> and we prayed. Then they were at the Thursday Miracle Revival Hour the following Thursday. I didn't know they were there, but I prayed again and I said, now go back and buy baby things after 20 years. And the woman became pregnant. <laughs> now they married on the 22nd of January 1966 and the woman delivered on the 22nd of January. <laughs> 1987. After 21 years. What I'm saying is this. Faith is believe in the sufficiency of God's word through Christ to solve all problems. In Matthew chapter 8 Matthew chapter 8 verse 8 The centurion answered and said Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. That's what we need. The word only. And that word is sufficient. Sufficient. Number one, faith is belief in the absolute truthfulness of God's word. Two, faith is a strong persuasion in divine ability. Number three, faith is belief in the sufficiency of God's word through Christ to solve all problems. Number four, faith is complete confidence in the intercessory ministry of Christ. Faith is complete confidence in the intercessory ministry of Christ. When Jesus rose from the dead, he went to the Father. But then, during those 40 days of giving his own disciples infallible proof of his resurrection, he'll come to them and go to the Father again. Come to them, go to the Father again. But eventually, he left. And as he left, he told his own disciples, it's profitable for you that I go away. If I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come unto you. But if I go, I will pray to the Father that he will send you the Holy Spirit. I will intercede for you. Yes, you will pray. You will wait. You will tarry in Jerusalem. But have this confidence. As you are praying, I'll be praying to the Father. And you know that when I was here, he always answered my prayer. Even when we were separated by a long distance, the distance great enough to separate heaven from earth, he still answered me instantaneously and immediately. 
Now I am going to sit by his side. And I have nothing to talk about. I'm not going to be talking about angels, about administration in heaven. The only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be talking about you. I'll be praying the Father that he sends the Holy Ghost. So while you are praying, have the faith in the intercessory ministry of Christ right before the throne of God. That's faith. And since he prayed and the Holy Ghost came, he has not stopped praying for you as a member of the church. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So then what is faith? Faith is complete confidence in the intercessory ministry of Christ. And Jesus said when he was here on earth, in John chapter 11, John chapter 11, verse 42, And I knew that thou hearest me always. The prayer of Jesus will never go unanswered. And he's praying for every one of us. Amen. Now, it's, it's going to help you to think this way. That before you pray, you allow your mind, one way or the other, to be blank. And say, Lord, I want to pray for myself, for my family, for the church, for the sake, for anyone. But I don't know how to pray or what to pray for as I ought to. How should I pray? I know that many people have made that to be only for speaking in tongues, but it's much more than that. Because even when you are praying in your language, it is still the Spirit of God that helps you to pray as you ought to pray. We know that in preaching, we preach in our own language. And many times we have put down an outline. And yet we feel so insufficient in delivering the message. That we look up to the Lord and we say, Lord, you have to just empower me. You have to just give me what to say in preaching. And then as we are preaching, we just discover that even though we are talking in our own language. Or we are talking in English. The words are coming from him. And yet, it's in a language you understand. The same thing with prayer. At other times, you come before a group of people. And they're asking you questions. And you feel so insufficient and so embarrassed and so fearful. And you know that if the Lord doesn't minister to you through his spirit, you will not know how to answer. And when you know not how to answer, the spirit of God brings out an answer from within you. What Jesus said, that when they bring you before the council, do not premeditate what you will say. The spirit of your father in you will speak through you. So if you are before the Sanhedrin, how will the spirit of God speak through you? In Latin? In Igbo? Before the Sanhedrin? No, in the language of the Sanhedrin, which you already knew. So we know from all that, that even when you are praying in your language, the Lord can give you the desire and even the words. But the point I want to make is this. If I know that this desire is coming from him, then I know that Jesus Christ must be willing to present that same request before the Father as I am presenting. And if it is so, then I have the complete confidence in the intercessory ministry of Christ. I know that my prayer and his prayer. If two of us shall agree as touching anything on earth, but then I am here, he is there. If I'm in agreement with him, I pray, he prays, I believe that prayer will be answered. And when you make, when you make yourself to know that, not only to think it, but to know it, assuredly that you are praying here, another person is uh, praying before the throne of God in heaven on the same thing on the desires they had imparted into your heart, the prayer will be answered. 
That's faith. Now, number five. Faith is unshakable trust in Christ's power to do the impossible. Unshakable trust in Christ's power to do the impossible. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, And Jesus departed thence, when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came unto him, and Jesus says unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yea, Lord. Yes, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were opened. What then is faith? From that passage, it is unshakable trust in Christ's power to do the impossible. I've told you about faith and I've said what faith is not. And I've talked to you on what faith is. And all along the line, I've also talked along that this is how to have the faith. But then, what does faith do? What does faith do? What it does? Your desires after things depend on what you know about those things, what they can do. You'll never get seriously to want to buy a car if you don't know what that car will do for you. And why do people buy vehicles? Well, it will get them to where they want to go at the time they want to get there. It will ease up uh, the family trouble going up and down. For some people, it will give them prestige in the eyes of their neighbors. If that is what they feel it does, because they identify what the thing can do for them, they go after it. Or they might say, it will make them just look like all the other people, because it will make them stop having to say, brother or sister, can you give me your car so I can go to such and such a place? The point is, you must determine what that thing can do for you before you really seriously go after it. Now, listen. Have you discovered that we were not serious in the pursuit of education in the primary school? We became a little bit more serious in the secondary school. You get to the university. Are you, have you ever realized we don't ring bells for classes to start in university? Primary school, you have to ring a bell. You have to carry the weed. You have to call the children. You have to gather them together. Why? Because they don't know what education will do, so they don't personally, individually desire it for themselves. You have to force them into it. By the time you get to university, you know the meaning of having a degree. You know what that thing will do. Because you know what it will do. You don't need a bell. You know in our churches, Sometimes you have to make an announcement and make it strong on fasting and praying. You have to ring the bell. Why? They don't know what that thing will do. And you have to force them, encourage them, plead with them. Don't eat in the morning. By 10, 11, you'll feel seriously hungry, but don't, uh, don't answer. By 1 o'clock, it will appear you are going to die. You'll not be able to go through the day, but... Uh, you know, at that time, just uh, begin to maybe sing or kneel down and pray. Make up your mind that's the devil trying to cheat you. But when a man knows what that thing will do, when a man knows where he will get to, by prayer, faith, and fasting, you don't need to ring the bell. You don't need to make announcement. He knows what that thing will give him. So what will faith do? Because if you understand that and determine that, then you will reach after it, number one, what faith will do. Faith can do what all the religions in the world put together cannot do. Faith. It will do 
what all the religions of the world, the penance, the discipline, the pilgrimage, everything that all the religions of the world cannot do, all those religions, put them together. What those religions cannot do, faith can do. And when you realize that, that is much. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, Verse 39. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. The law of Moses, Judaism, was the greatest of all religions before the coming of Jesus Christ. And yet, even that greatest of all religions there was something it could not do. Not to talk of all the other lesser, less significant religions. So then, faith can give you justification, freedom from sin, total purity. In fact, in short, faith can give you all that God himself can do. And what all the religions of the world cannot do. Freedom, anything that you need, that the religions cannot do, faith can do it. I think if we really think about it, that is almost enough. You know, today the religions of the world, they boast of being able to cover the whole world. And you know why they boast like that? Maybe they have a lot of money. But remember that faith can do, go beyond that. Because after you are put together, what all the religious people in the world, with all the money, with all the technology, with everything that they have, when you have put everything together that they can do, begin to think about what they cannot do. And that's where faith has a meaning. And of course, the faith can do what they cannot do. It can also do in a better way, in a quicker time, what they can do at a slower rate. So that makes faith very important. Meditate on that. Number two, faith changes people. Faith changes people. It changes things and it changes circumstances. Put all your problems together. And you might find that your problems are in these three categories. You have problem with people. Faith can change them. You have problem with some things. Faith can change those things. You have problem with circumstances. Faith is at home, working, changing circumstances. Because of our time, I will not be able to give you too many references. But Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 40. And Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 14, and verses 20 to 24. Then in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, faith heals, faith delivers. In short, according to Mark chapter 9, verse 23, faith makes all things possible. Let's look up here. Here we are, that we have been called of God to preach the gospel. Or you have been called of God to build the home. Or you have been called of God to change society. Or you have been called of God to make an influence in this 20th century. Or you have been called of God to go on a particular mission and it appears it's so difficult or you have a work to do that you don't have the manpower you don't have the resources you don't have the money you just feel completely inadequate or you feel that your preaching is not enough your preaching is not having the same the, the weight it ought to have 
And then I came to you and I said, if you'll take this, I know what you've been designing, I know what you really want to do. I know that you want to preach like this and preach like that, but I've just discovered a Bible school, and it's only six months. And when you finish in this Bible school, take my word for it, that your preaching will be more effective than all the preachers put together you have ever known. What will be your response? What will be your attitude? You are likely, if you are the right type of person, and if you have a real desire, you are likely to abandon every other thing and say, if it is only six months, and you are telling me that this school will get me more than all the preachers I've ever read about, I think I'll go. Now, if you're a businessman, and I came to you, you've been looking for finance, you've been looking for this and that, and uh, you lack finance. And I came to you and I said, what do you know? That just around the corner, there is a course you can take, but apart from that, you have to also have to meet a particular person. And I've got assurance from him. And within three months, all the business uh, practice you need to understand and need to know to operate that business and all the capital you need. All that you need is do this, this, and this. Within three months, you get in touch with that man and you are going to do everything. In fact, you raise up your business to the point that no other businessman in this country has been able to do that. You'll be able to do what all the businessmen put together cannot do. If you are the right type of person, having the right type of desire within you, you're likely to say, whatever it will take, I'll give myself to it and develop that thing. Then if uh, you're on education, and you've been battling with having a degree, and I just came to you and I said, you know, I'm surprised this world is changing so fast. Now they told us now that the degree that we earned in three years, four years, they said it's available now for one single session. And they even said that they will teach those uh, students in such a way that if they just attend the class, even if they were the uh, most foolish, ignorant students that ever came to that school, that if they only attended just the present in the class, all through the nine months, they'll be able to get it. In fact, you know, it surprised me, they said, that you can come out with a certificate that no other person in this country has ever had. Nine months. You see? I have to go and register today. But now here I come, telling you that the faith we have spoken about today is the thing that can do what all the religions in the world put together cannot do. If you are like these other men and women in the pursuit of education and business and other things, if you are like them, you apply that to faith and say, if it's like that, I'll seriously start to develop my faith. After all, if Jesus tarries, the journey is still long. If Jesus tarries, we're still young. We have not lost anything. You are 35 years of age. Moses didn't start until 80 years of age. There's still time. You are 40 years of age. Joshua didn't start until more than 40 years of age. So, if you really mean it, and you say, let's forget the past, reaching forward to the things we have not got, Let's count the years past as wasted, if, if they are wasted, in the direction of developing faith. Instead of just mourning, sitting back and saying, if I had known this, I would have got this, I would have done this, I would have done this. No, there is still time. We are all young. And we can just make up our minds today and say, Lord, this is the greatest commodity. This is what I'm looking for. And I will have it. Now, how did Moses, a murderer, come to have this great faith that he challenged Pharaoh and the whole of the Egyptian empire? 
I'll discover it. How did Joshua? In the minority group, among all these thousands and millions of unbelievers, come to the point that he had the boldness, the courage to openly address the sun, stand over there. I'll find out. How did the farmer with 12, cattle, with 12 um, oxen plowing the field? Elisha, come to have this faith. Turn bitter water into sweet and change kingdoms. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the loan. I just thank God for all this provision. I just Great.